Welcome to the Art Channel. In this film, we're visiting the National Portrait Gallery in London. It was founded in 1856 as the world's first gallery of portraits representing the great and the good, pioneers in their field. We're going to be looking at a number of paintings and photographs in the gallery where artists explore the nature of what a portrait can be and the changing way they approach a sitter. So concepts of power and intimacy and how these are approached by artists. So here we're looking at a painting known as the Darnley Portrait uh, of Elizabeth I. This was painted in around 1575 by an unknown Flemish artist. But really, it's an interesting, I mean, it's a fascinating image to look at because it is an image all about power. It's painted from life, and that face is absolutely iconic. She looks out at the viewer and utterly commands her audience. It's quite mesmerising, isn't it? Mm. Because the artist, who is anonymous, um, has really drawn her eye to the brocade, the embroidery on her costume. He grants her this full status using objects, um, the richness of her clothing, but also the regalia of monarchy. And, and to give you some historical background, of course, Elizabeth was in quite a precarious position during the height of English Reformation. You know, she was challenged by Catholic pretenders, and she was also a woman. And we forget uh, that in the 16th century, it was quite unusual to have a female monarch. So this painting and others of its type were very much concerned with asserting her authority and legitimacy as the national ruler. And in the age, of course, long before television and um, mass communications, uh, a portrait like this might be the only glimpse you would have of the monarch during your entire life. So it was very important that a painting, so a portrait such as this, was invested with that kind of presence mm. that we can see in this wonderful uh, painting. And of course, this is a piece of work that was copied, used as a pattern mm. for other images of Elizabeth. And as you say, you wouldn't see your queen, you would see this possibly unlikely image of your queen, but I think that her, uh, as you say, regalia is very interesting. She's almost in military dress, so she's feminine and masculine, and, you know, it is an image about being utterly in control. We are in a display called Exposed, The Naked Portrait, and it is a collection of naked portraits. And we're looking at a piece by Gilbert and George called In the Piss, made in 1997. And I think it's typical of their very challenging, very in-your-face kind of images. It's actually a photographic image made up of nine panels. Um, originally, the panels were these sizes because this was a maximum mm. size of photographic paper. Well, they're two middle-aged men, and they are actually uh, partners or boyfriends. And this is from a series where they um, photograph themselves against bodily fluids. So immediately they're addressing, aren't they, uh, a taboo around mm. excretion and fluids that sustain us. Part of the cycles of the body mm. during the course of uh, life. Um, why are they photographing themselves, though, against uh, urine? You know, it's clearly provocative, mm, isn't it? Mm. Well, I think it's part of this direct sort of frank provocation that's very much characteristic of their work. I mean, it's undeniable that urine is integral to the body and to life. Um, but here they're clearly connecting it to the self-portrait. Mm. It's a revelation, isn't it? It's mm. exposing themselves as frankly as they possibly can. I think... It's, I mean, we're used now to looking at Gilbert and George um, challenging us, asking us to be slightly uncomfortable. And I think that's a very refreshing and um, positive development in portraiture. They have a whole series of these images and they are always challenging the viewer. They definitely tap into a tradition of portraiture. Um, they meet our gaze, but also this, in a weird way, reminds me of a stained glass window, the way it's set up, this black leading. So there are connections to art history. They are, um, you know, uh, challenging it, but also part of it. But it is radically different mm. from uh, the Darnley portrait of Elizabeth I we've been looking at. It has an entirely different kind of interest and purpose, doesn't it? This is much more kind of subjective and private and intimate. Um, clothing is irrelevant to this portrait. It's about being as kind of natural and free and honest as it can possibly be. 
I'm not sure if it's private. I'm sure I think it's incredibly public, mm. and I think that's that's the the discomfort that it's uh, it's a private world made public. Uh, and I think obviously the nature of portraiture changes, and we are now looking at normal humans with normal bodies and normal bodily functions. So it's an entirely different take on um, a connection with the viewer. But nevertheless, it's still a shock, isn't it, mm. in the national collection? Yeah of portraits that represent the great and the good, yeah. the highest achievement in our nation, to see two people at their most kind of transgressive of sort of uh, traditional notions of decency, mm. both in terms of the body, but also the inclusion of uh, excretion. Mm. I mean, as a female viewer, the biggest shock is that they're men, naked men. We have had a Western tradition of naked women and nobody's shocked by that. Mm. This, for me, is the shock that we have two naked middle-aged men. In this temporary exhibition of uh, the nude portrait, we have an image of Jermaine Greer, uh, the writer of the female eunuch and also an academic. She's a notoriously feisty, opinionated character, full of um, fire and uh, sort of intellectual uh, brilliance. But here she's represented naked in a room where she says she's normally naked. It's by Polly Borland. Uh, originally it was taken for a series called The Australians. What I really enjoy about this portrait is a sense of vulnerability in Germaine Greer's body language, effectively. And she's kind of partially grimacing at the camera, isn't she? Mm. It's a brave decision to represent herself in this fashion. But at the same time, there's a certain fragility or vulnerability mm. I can read on her body. I think this is an incredible portrait, and she's one of my heroes. This is the author of The Female Eunuch. This is somebody who changed the way we think about women, mm. we think as women. So she is an iconic figure. And she's been photographed and filmed many, many times. But as you say, there is a real air of vulnerability here. She looks a little bit like a Venus, which I'm sure she knows, quite coyly positioned on this mattress. But that diagonal of her arm and her knee covering her breasts, and she does look slightly awkward, although she's meeting our gaze she looks slightly awkward and it's rather an odd environment with that very sort of flowery wallpaper and really the only other prop is a pair of glasses which I think are rather nice kind of placed beside her obviously a reference to her uh, to her intellectual life so I think it's a very challenging and intimate portrait and if you compare it to the Gilbert and George piece which is very staged it's very knowing it's a provocation Germaine here is coiled around herself and I think there's that tension, isn't there, and that ambivalence between that bravado and at the same time still retaining a certain degree of uh, shyness about her Absolutely. body and being looked at uh, in perpetuity Absolutely. within a photograph. Although she did make the decision to, to strip off for the photograph. She didn't want to be filmed or photographed as a, as a sort of little old lady in a nursing mm. home type thing. So she made that decision to, to confront the viewer. And again, it is coy, and I think she is shy to a certain extent. But this is a 60-year-old woman naked in a portrait, and that's still quite rare. But you could argue that it's a strange decision for a woman who's arguing that we shouldn't be objectifying women, arguably in art mm. and in visual culture, because of this long tradition of representing the female nude as a primary mm. subject. And here she chooses to do that, perhaps in her own mind, as a form of empowering herself mm. and reclaiming that uh, traditional kind of mm. uh, trope in art. I mean, Jermaine Greer is fascinating because she adapts her views. She constantly challenges us with her writings and her opinions. So it is contentious and difficult and slightly awkward and, and all the better for it, I think. We're standing in front of a painting by Paul Brayson called Conservative Party Conference 1982. And it is an image of Margaret Thatcher mm. at the height of her powers, I suppose, with her, uh, her cabinet around her and her husband behind her. It's impossible not to draw analogies with the image of Elizabeth and the idea of power. Thatcher was um, uh, not a popular leader. She was a very, very contentious figure. And she was one of these people who had, again, uh, extreme control over her image and her image making. And I think this painting um, is a really, uh, it's a great snapshot 
a third of it, a band of grey at the bottom, nothing, bringing your eye up, meeting Thatcher's eye, and it's all about you know, supreme control. I'm interested in how he uh, stages this painting, um, as you've uh, mentioned, um, with her set on the podium mm -hmm. at the party conference. And you can imagine the auditorium is filled with like, you know, over a thousand uh, delegates listening intently to her. But it's very much part of that tradition of history painting. He's identified this as a pivotal moment, and indeed it was because she's giving the speech at the height of the Falklands mm. crisis. You know, this really now is history, mm. although many of us may still remember the events uh, surrounding her and this speech. It, it's fearsome, isn't it? She's a warrior here. All her followers are presented physically seated mm. at her feet. Mm. It's as if she has a sort of surrogate army behind her and Absolutely. around her. If we look at the text in the painting, Resolute Approach, this is very much tied up with Thatcher's um, uh, opinion of herself, the PR she put out about mm. herself. She, she you know, was this resolute woman uh, and really quite a reviled figure, I think, even as we look back on her. Very, very divisive figure. And as you say, she is standing. This is not uh, the artist making this up. This is mm. what happened. Uh, although she had a cabinet of people around her, she really was a leader. And I like the way that it's, it's very, um, it, it's painted in a very kind of sharp way, strong shadows, almost like a sort of 1950s poster. Mm. It really is um, redolent of the way Thatcher presented herself. He hasn't chosen to present her, as it were, sitting at her desk in, mm. her, in her office or on a sofa in her home, but rather this is a national event and she commands um, the scene. Mm, mm. And Thatcher, I think, as you say, was somebody who was uh, really quite happy to be presented in this way. Mm. We don't have that many images of her in her uh, family environment. Uh, it really was uh, a real hard PR drive to present her as somebody who, who could never be wrong. And this, this sharp painting in greys and blues really kind of, I think, communicates that. We're looking now at a portrait of Peter Cochrane, who was a art dealer and an art collector. And it's painted by Howard Hodgkin, the contemporary artist. And it's really intriguing because it departs from conventions of portraiture as a representation of the physical likeness mm. of the sitter. And Howard Hodgkin really ta has taken liberties with uh, this image. And I'm noticing how he extends the pattern of the shirt up towards Cochrane's neck and head, so it becomes a sort of brace, as if the pattern starts to sort of dominate mm. the whole image and the physical features uh, are fading away. Mm. I think it's a fascinating painting. I, I love the way it's framed, actually. It's in this incredibly sort of Baroque mm. uh, gilt frame. And then you have a very small, intimate, semi-abstract portrait of Cochrane. And you're right, it's, it, it's got one foot in abstraction and one foot in realism. And it almost looks like a skull, uh, as you say, being enveloped by this pattern. Cochrane was a great supporter of new kinds of abstraction. He supported mm. people like uh, de Buffet and Ellsworth Kelly. And this is a, quite an early Hodgkin. He's only about 30 when this is made, and his work gets I think more abstract but I love the pattern making I love the sketchiness I love the fact that you can see those lines from the shirt extending underneath the red so very contemporary portrait in that we can see the workings out nothing's hidden Hodgkin uses color very expressively there's almost a sort of fauve like mm -hmm. feel to it going back to Matisse early in the 20th century and he's sort of defiant really about making this portrait because it's so untraditional. I mean, utterly different from the portraits we've been looking at, but portraits, portrait painters are always wanting to distill some kind of essence from their sitter. And you're right, this is on the edge of abstraction, but I kind of know I'm looking at a man in a check shirt with a beard. I'm looking at his skull rather than his head. And I'm looking into his eyes. It's a small, intimate painting hung low. So we're becoming much more friendly, I guess, with uh, ideas around portraiture. We hope you enjoyed the film and you continue to enjoy our films. You can find us on YouTube, Art Channel One. Please give us a thumbs up. You can also follow us on Instagram and Twitter at the Art Channel One.